The Secrets of Star Trek is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, episode 146. Captain DeBridge. Spock here. Make it so. Surrender is not an option. Attention crew of the Enterprise, this is James Kirk. We are all explorers, driven to know what's over the horizon, what's beyond our own shores. We would have helped you get home if you had asked. That's who Starfleet is. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all the Star Trek TV series, movies, and more. And today we're discussing the original series episode, Galileo 7. Joining me today on the panel are Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. So why, if there are seven Galileo shuttles, do they then use one called (laughs) Columbus to search the planet? (laughs) (laughs) We'll discuss that in a minute. But first, uh, hi, Father Cory Stika. How's it going, Dom? (laughs) Very good. Folks, remember to share the podcast with your friends to help us grow the community of listeners. And uh, as the community grows, the, the show gets better. It's a fact. So, uh, yes, we were talking about this original series episode that uh, was from the first season. It's the 13th episode, about 14th episode. It all depends on how you count things, and it's, we've talked about that before. But uh, it's basically just a quick recap. Box in command of the Galileo shuttlecraft. It crashes. He has to try to be use his logic to solve the situation, and all the stupid emotional humans keep getting in the way. <laughs> oh. <laughs> From a certain point of view. Yeah. <laughs> From a certain point of view. I know. Let's talk about it. Let's start with the setup. So they're on their way to a planet called Macus 3, or Macus mm-hmm. 3, and they're bringing medical supplies to help with the plague on a colony called New Paris, which I gather is not on Macus 3. It's like a separate planet. Right. But on the way there, they run into the Murasaki 312 Quasar, and it's described as a mysterious Quasar-like formation, and they have standing orders to investigate Quasars whenever they run across them. And so they send Spock and this science team, which includes Dr. McCoy for some reason, in, <laughs> in the Galileo shuttle to to go get closer to the nebula, to the quasar, and but it's really a nebula, and do an investigation, and that's when things go off the rails. So to start off with, quasars are enormously powerful objects that emit thousands of times the amount of energy that the Milky Way galaxy does. We do not have one in our galaxy, or we would know it. Yeah. <laughs> Also, the Murasaki quasar. So Murasaki is Japanese for purple. This quasar is not purple. It is green in the uh, visuals that are at least in the the remastered version. I don't know what it was in the original. It's described in the script as being blue. So they don't know what a quasar is. They don't know what Murasaki means. And the premise is ridiculous. Yeah. Because, <laughs> because, okay, we have, uh, as our guest villain of the week, Galactic High Commissioner Ticking Clock, who, <laughs> right. is, who is here to remind Kirk constantly that the plague supplies have to be delivered to the first planet in five days, and it's going to take three days to get there, so we only have two days to search for Spock. And so he's yep. just here to be annoying and remind Kirk that there's a ticking clock over and over again. But here's the real reason the premise is stupid. The Quasar will be here when you come back. Mm -hmm. Okay? What kind of big government bureaucracy nonsense is this? Your plague relief efforts are worse than the state of California's vaccine rollout. Get the COVID vaccine (laughs) to New Paris now. People are dying. (laughs) That's right. Right. Like, you don't want to get them just as the rendezvous was yeah. supposed to take place. Get there a little early because maybe the other ship is going to get there a little early. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I do want to say that the, uh, High Commissioner Ferris is the officious bureaucrat second-guessing all of Kirk's decisions of the week. 
And, and yeah. this is not the only time we see this. No, we see this on other occasions. And I, in this, in some cases, you need that role personified. You know, like it, the the metamorphosis story just would not work without mm-hmm. High Commissioner, whatever her name was, on Father Knows Best. You know, right. she <laughs> needs to be there for the plot to work. But here, you do not need High Commissioner taking clock. He could he could he could vanish from the plot and we could watch Kirk wrestle with his own conscience right about how how much time can I afford and I'm going to have to make the hard call to leave at some point that would be much more effective it would in in yeah. fact having Dr. McCoy on the ship uh, you know to have give Kirk a confidant that he mm-hmm. could talk about his wrestlings internally with that would be much more effective than what we get here Right. Well, also, speaking of McCoy, like you said, why are McCoy and Scotty and the Yeoman on this mission to do a scientific survey of this quasar-like object? Well, I'm not sure what they're going to be doing, if they're just there for sightseeing or something or other. There should really only be three people on that shuttle, or was it four people, you know, all scientists of, of one sort or another, perhaps. So that was kind of dumb. But obviously McCoy is there in order to provide his usual foil to Spock. But in this case, I I really dislike what they do here with, yeah. with McCoy. And Boma is even worse, uh, the, the scientist Boma crewman. Well, and it really sets up, it, this, this episode really sets up the trope that we see over and over and over again of Spock's logic versus McCoy's and Boma's emotion. And, of course, right. the, you know, the resolution is... You know, the having to bring in more of that emotional response, you know, instead of just pure logic. But it see it sets up that trope that then we see constantly throughout throughout Star Trek, really. Right. So part of what this episode is doing at its core is answering the question, what would Spock be like as a captain? Because since they're out of contact with the Enterprise, he's in command. And McCoy talks to him about him being in command and he says, Well, I admit it has its fascinations, but I also don't desire it. It's neither I'm afraid of it. It's just kind of there. And he's then going to use his logic, but he's also going to learn a lesson because human emotion has a role in things. His Vulcan ideology needs to be more flexible. And we see that emerge over the course of this episode. By the end, it's an emotional decision that saves them. So, you know, it's an and that concept of what would Spock be like as a captain and how would he learn from the experience? That's that's interesting that I can ease. That's a legitimate topic for an episode. In this case, though, wow, he's he in my notes early in the episode, he is blowing this command because (laughs) every every single person it is. You would expect McCoy to be unhappy with Spock's approach. But it's not just McCoy. It is every single person on that shuttlecraft, with the exception of Scotty. Right. And Scotty is kept busy doing engineering stuff the whole episode. So everybody is dissing Spock in this because of how badly they think he's doing and unnecessarily costing lives. And he even admits at one point that he has been blowing it because he didn't realize how emotional the natives on this uh, planet they end up on are. I have to say that I hope that when Boma, when they get back to the Enterprise, that charges are brought up against Boma for insubordination, because <laughs> yeah. that guy was a jerk. <laughs> Let me just like from the start, they he they everybody, but especially Boma questions Spock's orders. Like yeah. if this were if this were Kirk in this situation instead of Spock, they, nobody would be questioning his orders. And mm-hmm. well, you know, we're going to have to drop three five hundred pounds. That's the weight of three grown men. Oh, I know that's a tough decision. How are we gonna, possibly going to do that, Captain? We're behind you, Captain. Like, I just felt like it was almost artificially biased mm. against Spock right from the start. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and it, the only one that I mean, he did kind of question, but not a lot is Scotty. But that's only because half the episode he was had his head down in that hatch trying to <laughs> fix the shuttlecraft. Yes, you know. Well, if you're going to crash on a on a on an alien planet, well, in your shuttlecraft. The one guy you want with you is Scotty. I'll take Scotty over yeah. everybody on that case. We know why we, he we was We can turn there. phaser power into fuel. I mean, <laughs> if you can do that, you can do anything. <laughs> Scotty is the miracle worker. So even McCoy does question Spock's fitness and agrees with Boma that there's something wrong with Spock. I, it's, 
there's this exchange that they have. Like McCoy says, Mr. Spock, life and death are seldom logical. And Spock says, but attaining a desired goal always is, Doctor. Now, gentlemen, I suggest we move outside to make a further examination of the hull in the event we've overlooked any minor damage. And it's just this 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 back and forth where McCoy is always wanting to like have a philosophical debate and Spock's like, Okay, yeah, that's that's good, but we're we're trying to get off the planet here. So t- I don't really have time to have your philosophical debates about logic versus emotion. It was very yeah, it was it, it was a little ham fisted a, a bit there. Well, and, and there's there's a whole scene of of the the burial. You know, you have to have a proper burial. Well, McCoy, uh-huh. get out there and do it. Yeah, we are, survival right. is more essential than burying the dead. I mean, it uh, really is. If you just look, even just the the, the old trope of the uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Just surviving, the rest of the people surviving is a little more important than dealing with the bodies of those who have died. Yeah. I, it's, it, I also find it really implausible at the end, even though they need to get into orbit as quickly as possible, lest they be left behind. They're insisting right. on the burial for the two guys who have gotten killed. <laughs> and Spock says, okay, Mr. Scott, when are you going to be ready? He says, eight minutes. Okay, we're taking off in 10 minutes. You've got 10 minutes to bury those bodies without phasers to cut graves for them. Right. It's like, Dude, do you know how long it takes to dig a grave? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or even just pile rocks over the bodies. I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. You didn't see the 23rd century shovel sitting next to him? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I should point out, by the way, that uh, the red shirts in this episode are played by two guys in gold shirts. <laughs> this yes. time, Latimer and Gaetano, they, they, they are the ones who encounter the natives, and Latimer is the first one killed. Gaetano gets killed, too. Statistically, the red shirts actually apparently things to be seems to be a bit of a myth that actually yeah. people in gold and blue actually get killed a lot yep. but so as soon as spock says three must stay behind i have two notes the first one is so what because <laughs> all you need is to get that shuttlecraft up into orbit where the enterprise can detect it and then you can come back for the three you left behind. So why are you so concerned about that? You Beam don't even up. know. Yeah, you don't <laughs> yeah. even know about the giant cavemen at this point. You have no reason to be concerned. The second point is people are going to die mm-hmm. because that's how they're going to deal with the situation. And indeed, they right. they're able to get some equipment off, but two of them still have to die. And you can even tell which two it's going to be. It's going to be the two white guys because <laughs> the only other options are main characters. It's not going to be Spock or Scotty or McCoy that dies, and it's not going to be the the cute young female yeoman, right? Yep. Because that would upset the audience, and it's not you going to be it's not going to be the black gentleman because this is the 1960s, and we're trying to give a black actor a solid meaty part, which mm-hmm. it means he's going to survive. Right. And and all of those are laudable things, but it does make it, uh, well, we've got these two white extras here. Guess who's going to die? Yep. So, the you Italian know, and... <laughs> yeah. The, it, yeah. I, I, Gaetano is Italian. I'm not sure what ethnicity Latimer is, um, <laughs> but uh, but it's it's a little predictable. It is. Also, it if is. they're all scientists, why do we have gold shirts on board? They should all be in blue. Well, I guess Latimer's a pilot, so let's let's give him the benefit oh, okay, of the doubt. Okay. He's yep. in the pilot seat, but yeah, I, I there are some there are laudable el- elements to this story. Like I, I think, like you mentioned, Spock was right in many cases with his mm-hmm. command decisions. They shouldn't waste time on memorial ceremonies. He's also right to reject the majority vote mm-hmm. in a military hierarchical mm-hmm. organization to attack the natives, whereas you know he 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 determines that the best the thing is use the minimum force necessary to accomplish our goals. Now, right. that doesn't work out, yeah, acknowledging, but that doesn't mean that was a mistake either. No, and it was kind of a mistake for the other people to oppose him. Also, they have stun settings on those phasers. What, right. uh, why, why, do, why is your first thought, we've got to kill them? Right. Yes. Yeah, by the way, I want to make clear that I'm all for giving meaty, nice meaty roles to females and people of all ethnicities. Sure. Yeah. Yes. It's just given the 60s and thinking like a writer, you can kind of tell, okay, how this is going to yeah. play out. And, and right. to be fair, we're, we're, we're living in a time right now when literally as they're writing episodes, they need to make sure they check this many of this minority, this many <laughs> yeah. of this minority, this, you know, right. I mean, it, it's, it, and that's, that's, that's not even a secret that we, we know that clearly. Um, you know, I, I think it's interesting you know, we talk about uh, one of the, one of the, proofs that Spock's logic is failing is because people die, and yet they had a rescue team not run by Spock, not run by a Vulcan, who lost one person and two other people were injured. 
So right. mm-hmm. I do like the ramping up of the drama in that case because it makes it like how many people, how many lives are you willing to trade to rescue these people? I mean, there's Kirk himself is put in this command decision situation where where his command is being questioned by the mm-hmm. high commissioner, not by his own crew, uh, but where he's having to make these judgments about. You know how many people are willing to trade to get these guys back, and the situations, and and, and that sort of thing. So there's a parallel in the story there. So I kind of like that, uh, and how they each make different decisions. Spock's decisions are based primarily on logic. Kirk's are based on hunches and emotional attachments. They think, but there's also logic and emotion on both sides of it, just in different amounts. Uh, so I like that. A really good line I like from Kirk was when he says, I'll thank you to keep your nose off my bridge, Mr. Commissioner. <laughs> I just was going to add that in. I really like that. <laughs> uh-huh. There are some there are some good lines in this and some interesting things. Like, I really like the fact that at the beginning of the episode, we get to see the shuttle bay operational. Yes. Mm-hmm. And this is a rare thing for TOS or really for any of the series. We get a nice, like, reverse angle shot of the shuttle bay staring out through the space doors. We see the shuttle Galileo 7 on the turntable to line it up to fly out, and then it flies out. And it's great. I love that. I love it a little bit less when the crew woman says phase one separation normal is like, what do you separate from? You don't have rocket stages here. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, we have uh, this tense moment where they're first going into the nebula and things are starting to go wrong. And it brings out the dangers of the early space age. You know, mm-hmm. and the fears that astronauts mm-hmm. in the 60s were having. They then crash on this planet called Taurus 2 that is apparently known, but people don't know anything about it. And for once, we've got a, a nice technological failure situation because they've got all this magic technology on the ship that they could use to solve any problem. And, you know, frequently it's either ignored or magically there's it just is not working for some reason but here we've got a reason okay we've got this we've got this um nebula that is ionizing everything and so they can't transport through it and they do an intelligent thing they try transporting through it with inert material and it comes back messed up so like that makes sense that <laughs> you would want to test out a transporter in a dangerous situation like this before you tried doing it with a human being. In fact, you'd have mm-hmm. a progression. You'd start with, with you know, metallic or inorganic material. Then you'd progress to let's try a plant. Then let's try an animal. Then let's right. try an ape and then a human. So that all makes sense. I bet you didn't know they had ape cages on the Enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't smell really great, so we never no. see them. That's right. Also, the phones are out because of the ionizing radiation, so they can't just talk to them down on the planet or find them that way. Their sensors are out, and so they have visual-only searching capabilities, and so they launch a new shuttlecraft, Shuttle McShuttleface, to go look for them. (laughs) And uh, actually, they call it the Columbus, but Shuttle McShuttleface is a much better name. That would be much better. Oh, yes. And and they they have it orbiting the planet. They figured out they're probably on the planet, and they they have it doing sweeps. But it's going to take them a long time to cover the surface of the planet with one shuttlecraft. Well, you apparently have at least eight because there are seven Galileos. You should have them all out there. <laughs> I, I kind of want to point out. I I'm pretty sure Galileo Seven refers to the seven people on the shuttle. Oh, as really? To the Galileo, seventh, is also, Galileo. Galileo is also Galileo is also craft number seven. I thought they were. Yeah, it's it's like NC one seven oh one slash seven. Because later on in the season there'll be the Galileo two that replaces this one apparently. Hmm. Yeah. But okay. Also, um, are uh, are there seven people? I I'm looking. Yeah, there's seven. There are seven people that were okay. on that shuttle to start with. Anyway. Oh. <laughs> well, I took it. You put a number after a space thing, and I'm thinking it's a it's it's a number in a sequence. Right. You know, like Sol three is Earth. Well, yes. See, uh, mm-hmm. See, I, I took this, you know, Galileo Seven as in like, you know, the uh, um, what's the old movie, the uh, Seven? They just Magnificent Seven. Magnificent Seven. See, I took it oh. as kind of a spinoff of that. Yeah, mm. yeah, there's that too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You have that opening scene where Spot gathers all the samurai and they're going to defend <laughs> yeah. the village. And, yeah, <laughs> well, I didn't say it was a direct. <laughs> <laughs> I do like, in, interestingly, so when when they get on the planet, they send the some of the people who are working on the shuttle to get it operational again, and they send some other guys out to explore, 
and and they start hearing this weird sound effect and they start debating it's like it's in front of us no now it's behind us it's all around us we're surrounded by menacing sound effects <laughs> and then it turns out there are these giant cavemen that were later told now the actor who played them actually is 7 feet tall yes but we're told they stand like 10 to 12 feet tall and it looks like 10 to 12 feet tall the way they have it on screen at points they're apparently a stone age culture they have uh they don't seem to have evidence of metal technology but they've got these giant spears that they throw with the accuracy of an imperial stormtrooper <laughs> yes and, <they> do. <laughs> and with these huge spear points and and so the first guy um Latimer I guess gets yes. speared in the back and when they come by and they pull and Spock pulls the spear out of him, man, he was basically transfixed by that thing. The, on this, it, there's almost a foot of blood on that spear point. It just <laughs> yeah. must have like almost gone completely through him. Yeah. Yes. Meanwhile, up in orbit, they're searching and thing. You know, Commander Ticking Clock is there, and so he's pressuring Kirk, and Kirk starts to say, "Okay, Mister Sulu, have the or." Have the, Uhura have the shuttle like alter its orbit a little bit, which Sulu points out will create gaps of like mm -hmm. a couple of kilometers between each pass, so we won't be mm -hmm. seeing everything. Okay. And Kirk is yes, but we'll have a much better chance of surveying the whole of the planet surface. And it's like geometrical note for Captain Kirk: varying the orbit so that there are two-mile gaps, will not actually increase the total amount of the planet's surface you're able to survey. Right. <laughs> you, you'll still survey the same amount of territory. The question is, do you want it contiguous or not? Right, right, right. Yeah, that, that is, yeah that's a good point. You know, speaking of the, the Torian aliens, I, I kind of like that they were kind of clever in this, is where when we saw the creatures with the spear and they had a, a leather shield, they were one size. But then when they would show them in the ones that Spock and the other crew members lifting up or grabbing, they were they were now larger. So they created two sides of these in order to make the seven foot tall guy appear to be 10 to 12 feet yeah. uh, tall. Mm -hmm. uh, so I like that. Apparently, the, they never we never see the face, which is a mask on the creatures, uh, apparently because they thought it was too scary to show on network TV. Uh, which is kind of funny because there are a couple of shots like stills you, that you can find online where you can actually see the face. And it's not all that scary, but but I guess that back in the late 60s, it would have been scary for the kids. It it looks kind of like one of the Gargantuas from War of the Gargantuas. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, th there is a point where they, ha they, they electrify the hull of the ship in order to repel the creatures. And so what you have is Scotty standing at this console yeah. with a, a, an insulated glove and a screw uh, wrench and yeah. and basically putting it making sparks as he touches the two uh the two terminals of the yeah. of the battery or something like that. I'm, I'm not sure how that actually electrifies I think he's, the hull. He's, well, I don't know how it electrifies the hull, but <laughs> but James Dewan is really doing that. Yeah. Yes. That is not a special That's effect. A he's there with giant rubber gloves and a wrench and making sparks by yeah. I mean, and those are real sparks. Yeah, that that's a practical <laughs> effect. I mean, that's about as practical as you can get. Yeah, that was that was pretty good. That was uh, that was good. One of the things I like is, and I thought this was a really great moment. So after Spock has been out with uh, Boma and Gatano trying to scare off the natives with the phasers, and they have all this conversation and drama about how we're <laughs> going to do it, but they finally do it. Yep. And then Spock is like, "Okay." Gatano, you stay here on guard. Boma, you come back with me to the shuttle. And <laughs> it's like, how about we all three go back to the shuttle if we've scared them off? Um, yeah. But but it's like, okay, this is death sentence for, for Gatano, and Boma knows it. And as he's walking off, he, like, sympathetically pats Gatano on the shoulder. It's like, man, you are so doomed. And, <laughs> Sorry, and of, course, of course he is. He, he like, the next thing that happens with Gatano is he dies. Yes. Tried to climb the rock wall. <laughs> yeah. Trying to get away really ineffectively. Yeah. And this is just Spock making bad decisions. There's no need to put this guy out there on guard duty. You've got right. tricorders on the ship. Set one of them to wide area sweep. You're detecting right. life forms with those things all the time. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that it's like they're they're creating situations to uh, highlight 
Spock's bad decision making, as which, which it's just it's just not the sort of thing you would logically do. There was no logical, like you said, there was no logical reason for Gaetano to be out there, it just, except mm-hmm. to die, and so yeah. for the plot reasons. Uh, yeah, I I do like that they they then uh, even though okay so. On the shuttle, Scotty's trying to repair it, and there's a fuel leak, and they lose all their fuel, which we're led to believe from previous episodes is antimatter. I mean, they have warp nacelles on there. Mm. Yeah. Why doesn't the whole planet explode? Well, well, maybe the impulse engines run on something different than the warp engines? Maybe, but then take the warp engines and use them to get into orbit. Yes, yes. This, you know, so this this isn't making any sense. But then they decide that they can drain their phasers and get into orbit. Yeah. And I'm going, okay, maybe um, phasers would contain enough power, given futuristic batteries, that you could get a shuttle this size up into orbit. I'm I'm willing to go there. And they actually fairly logically start. They don't point this out, which is interesting. But they fairly logically start surrendering the phasers to Scotty one by one to be drained. Mm-hmm. Which makes sense because you don't want to deprive yourself of all protection until the last minute. Yep. They could have, I think, they could have even gone there and said, "This is what we're doing," and it would have been fine, so that everyone on the shuttle, as well as in the audience, would have understand this is the logical plan we're following. Right. I, I did. I do like that about the about the plot is this idea that they have to trade defense with escape. You know, for escape that the, that they can't just. You know, we're going to have to be a little bit defenseless at the moment, you know, we're vulnerable at the moment of escape. And I do kind of like them putting them in that position. So I, I did like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, one more thing I want to mention, you mentioned the, the, the sh- seeing the shuttle bay and the shuttlecraft. This is the definitive original series shuttle episode. You know, all subsequent effect yeah. shots throughout the series right. of shuttles use the shots from this one. So uh, given that, the reason we have transporters on the show in the first place was because of they didn't want the expense of building shuttles and having the shuttles flying back and forth right. uh, in, a, in effect shots. It's kind of funny that halfway through the season, they said, ah, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. yep. So that was good. Meanwhile, back up in orbit, they've got the transporters back online. They figured out how to beam through this ionizing stuff. And so Kirk orders sending down landing parties. Instead of, <laughs> instead of using telescopes and other things de- capable of detecting large objects like shuttlecrafts. This really doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, yeah. you've only got 430 people on that ship. If you beamed all of them down, this is an Earth-sized planet. Yeah. There's right. no, this, is, this is ridiculous. I mean, stay yeah. in orbit and use your, use your orbital assets to find that shuttle. But they do it anyway. They need to put people in danger so that someone dies, and thus Kirk has to make the moral quandary of, you know, how many lives do I trade? That whole thing. But, yeah. 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 I mean, it would be one thing if you were beaming landing parties down to uh, promising locations where there might be something there. Our sensors can't get through. You know, our sensors aren't working, so we should send somebody down to go check this out. Yeah, but even Mark One Eyeballs through a telescope can look down and say, that's a shuttle, isn't it? (laughs) Right, right. It is true. (laughs) Uh, so they, uh, they do eventually get the, uh, shuttle off the ground. They've, oh, they've... Well, first though, we have this yeah. attack by the natives where, okay. or the one that we ever get to see at a time, even though right. they imply there are many. And I love the scene of the giant caveman bashing on the shuttle with a rock. <laughs> That's just <laughs> great. Huge I love that huge rock. Just bang, bang, bang. And we get to see him doing that. We don't just hear it from the inside. I mean, we get to see it from the outside. And he's, it's great. I love that. Uh, and this is the scene then where Spock decides to electrify the outer hull of the shuttle. And I'm going, wow, good thing that rock that he was bashing the shuttle with was electrically conductive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so they, they, they have to, so as we say, uh, they do have to uh, finally get rid of the dead weight. Uh, no pun intended. Actually, that was intended. I'm going to take oh. credit for that. They get rid of the dead weight <laughs> and are able to lift off, and they're only going to be able to maintain orbit for a very limited period of time. And you know that the Enterprise's time is run out, and oh. Ferris has ordered Kirk to leave, and so Kirk leaves very slowly. <laughs> yeah, space normal speed, whatever that yeah. is, but clearly slowly. Yeah, I figured. I figured it's full impulse or something like that. You know, just just fast enough to say, yeah, we're leaving, but not at warp. 
And so as, they, uh, as they're yeah. about to take off, you know, they're doing the burial, or when we see the end of that, with these two nicely packed mounds of dirt that they somehow managed to excavate and repack in 10 minutes. <laughs> and and then we have this dramatic moment where Spock is pinned by an obviously styrofoam boulder. Oh, my God. And, <laughs> Very and, obvious. And, and, and McCoy and, and, uh, and Boma have to help him out and get him back to the shuttle, after which he's lecturing them. Yep. About, <laughs> and saving him. You should have left me behind. It's like, dude, you just authorized us to waste 10 minutes burying these people. Yep. Uh, <laughs> right. We, we have one, 10 seconds. We could take 10 <laughs> seconds to save a live one. Yeah. But then they, they get up into orbit. And I like how, you know, we see some like rock, for, or like a rock formation in the shuttle's window. And then we see it tilt up as they're able to get off the ground and stuff. And they have to use some extra booster fuel to get up into orbit. And, and, when they get up into orbit, Mr. Spock says we, or Mr. Scott says we need that fuel to maintain orbit. So we're basically going to come right back down. Right. And I'm going, do you know what orbit means? Yeah, orbit is when you're in a trajectory a, around a body where your uh, inertia makes you want to go forward, but gravity pulls you around the body into a loop, yep. so you don't have to spend a lot of fuel. I, it's I not, suppose, this is not this yeah. is not like an airplane where you've got to continuously spin fuel to stay off the ground or that's that's deliberately yeah. not the point of an orbit. I suppose if you're a low enough orbit there's a right. atmospheric drag that you have to counteract so maybe they don't Oh, but they you're talk right. about we're going to go back down yeah. into the atmosphere. It's like you're guys, right. this is the space age talk to NASA and find out how this works when you're <laughs> developing the script. They even right. had a they even had a consulting service to Forest Research that was looking at these things for them. I know, I know. Yeah, they 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 needed some way of the drama of having them going to fall back and 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 the fuel being the big thing cuz Spock plays a hunch and ignites jettisons the fuel and ignites it so that it creates like a flare some like a kind of yeah. flare that they can see from enterprise and that's enough to get the enterprise to come back he does say something interesting here spock does he says uh he says he doesn't believe in angels mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. by which he presumably means he doesn't believe in miracles mm -hmm. right? and yet he acts on a hunch you know so and, and they are saved here based on this unlikely illogical uh, <laughs> act of his, yeah. So it's kind of funny there. Um, one thing it's in, that's interesting is after Ferris gives Kirk that final command, the the, the high commissioner yeah. uh, t ticking clock of you now I'm taking command of this sh ship under galactic order, whatever. Uh, we never <laughs> see him again. I know he like goes back to his stateroom and chills. <laughs> yeah, right. He is he is completely absent from the 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 fourth act of this of this show, and it's I thought it was kind of odd because we we don't. We don't get. Uh, we're not able to get Kirk to say, "I told you so." There's no continuing. Hey, Kirk, why are you leaving sl so slowly? Like, you know, step it up a notch. Let's go. I know you're dragging your feet. There's none of that. Well, I think that the reason he vanishes is because they don't want him dropping the hammer on Kirk for twisting his orders. They want to right. show the audience that Kirk is twisting his orders to have the maximum chance of saving the crew. Because he cares about his crew, not all of the people dying of the plague on New Paris. Yeah, <laughs> right. And right. and so he needs to not be there in order to not order Kirk to go right. at warp speed. But it also illustrates just how unnecessary he is to the plot, because Kirk could make the same decision. It's like, we've got to go now, but we're going to go space normal speed, and I just hope we can give him a little extra time. Right. You know, something right. like that. So after Spock jettisons and ignites the fuel, we, we see the nice trail across the planet, and they're able to identify something there. And they get, Uhura announces they've got a transporter lock, and then Sulu, and they beam him out, and we see him beaming out, and they leave the shuttle to burn up. And then Mr. Sulu says, whatever it was, it just burned up. And it's like, didn't you just have a lock on five life forms inside of it that you beamed <laughs> over? Right, um, right. But then the transporter room calls up and says, we've retrieved five people, and Kirk is incredibly relieved. It's like, dude, you lost two of them. Are, right. Aren't you curious who those two were? <laughs> I mean, that would right. be my first question. Is like, who didn't we get or who did we get? But instead, right. he turns to Mr. Sulu and says, 
implement the course for Marcus 3 Warp Factor 1. Because once again, he just doesn't care about all of those COVID victims <laughs> on New Paris. Full speed ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Get there as quick as you can. Yes, that's true. Uh, well, yeah, they, they, they have the usual thing where people they're sitting around on the bridge afterward, uh, kind of relaxed and joking. Never mind the three people who died, uh, yeah. the, the Latimer Gaetano and the landing party dude who took a spear. Right. Uh, but uh, Kirk does get Spock to say, you know, in the end, you know, the whole joking, the 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 clarinet of humor uh, to say that he reasoned it was the logical time for an emotional outburst. And that's what happened there, uh, which is although Spock says he wouldn't put it that way. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah, and, and, it is. Uh, yeah. And, and then we have the entire bridge crew doing exaggerated, endless pantomime laughter. Oh, that over the beginning of the credits. I mean, it's like they said, okay, guys, just laugh and keep pretending to laugh for about 30 seconds as we film this. <laughs> right. It was uproariously it is, funny. Yes. It, it it was not that funny of a joke. <laughs> oh, we're all laughing at the captain's joke. Ha ha. We want to get a promotion. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, in the end, I I mean, despite its flaws, uh, this uh, I really enjoyed this. This is one of my my favorite episodes of the first season, uh, mm -hmm. I think, for, for me anyway. Um, because I mean, part of it may be the nostalgia. When I was a kid, I didn't see the the you know the flaws, uh, but I liked I liked Spock being put in command and having to see Spock as more than just the side the the science officer sidekick, but sort of doing something on his own. And I did like that about this episode uh, as a kid and and now. So I did like that part. Uh, any final thoughts on this, Father Corey? Well, it, it, it's interesting, you know, again, you know, as I've said, every time we've watched a TOS episode, this really is my first watch through of, of TOS. Oh. And it's interesting to watch this back with, you know, like, like I said, this trope of the emotion of McCoy versus the logic of Spock is such a trope that doesn't just stay in TOS. You see it throughout TNG and Voyager and DS9, and, you know, it's, it's kind of a continuing trope. And it's kind of interesting where this, at least it feels to me like this is where it started from. This was really mm -hmm. the first episode that they really, other than poking at it throughout the episodes, you know, kind of, you know, you, you green blooded Vulcan or whatever, you know, that McCoy right. always accuses of them, you know, but that this is the first time they actually put it as a actual trope within the, ep the central part of the episode. So it is kind of interesting to look back and see at that. And I mean, it is, it is an enjoyable episode, you know, there are, with the weaknesses we mentioned. Uh, one thing that is interesting is this is the first appearance of the Galileo shuttlecraft, as we we kind of mentioned, and so right. the, it was built for the 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 prop was built for this episode, and the prop was eight years ago restored. It was actually oh. bought at an auction and restored by uh by someone by Alec Peters, who's involved in he was involved in it. He's the one who's does Axonar, but there's another another fan who bought the prop, got it completely restored, and then donated it to NASA's Johnson Space Center. For the museum there where you cool. can now go and see the the actual galileo shuttlecraft prop but this is the nice. first time of according to the article on space.com uh seven times this prop shows up and this is the episode that they built it for cool cool so i'll, I'll send i'll send you the link to the the article dom yeah. so that you can put it in the show notes yes great idea great idea uh, jimmy so um Thinking back from my childhood and you know watching Star Trek after school and so forth in syndication, this was never one of my favorite episodes. And watching it, and I've seen it a number of times, but it's not one of the ones I rewatch regularly when I rewatch original series. Something about it, even back then, it's like this isn't doing it for me. I'm not sure. I I don't know if I could articulate why, but it wasn't one of my favorites. As an adult of today, I actually really like the core concept of this episode of watching Spock be put in command. And of course, this is not his first command, as they say right. in, in the thing. But I like the idea of having him in a situation where he's forced to be in command of a group of people and he's forced to learn something about the balance of reason and emotion because we have emotions for a reason, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> right. They, they promote survival, and as we see illustrated here by his final decision. And so I, I really I, like, I the, like the giant of this. Uh, caveman. I love the giant caveman bashing on the shuttle with a rock. 
That is awesome. <laughs> but just about everything else in the execution of this episode, I really don't like. You know, Leonard Nimoy, uh, in an interview about this episode, said that he struggled with this, with his character in this episode, because he had to account for the absence of Kirk. Like, you know, that, like mm -hmm. Spock would normally, it was created to be, Spock and McCoy were Kirk's angel and devil on the shoulder sort of thing. Not exactly the anal analogous, but... They were his super... id and his superego. Right. Okay. That, yeah, that's better. Uh, where, whereas Spock had to stand on his own in this, and... A quote from Nimoy in an inter in the interview he says, "I experienced it as a failure. Put into the position of being the driving force, the central character was very tough for me." He says. Mm. So I, th I thought that was interesting he, that he he himself did not consider this to be a success of a of an episode. So I thought that was interesting. Um, all right, I think we should wrap things up there. That was a good discussion. We do want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Star Trek, including Dennis S, Todd H, Rosemary P. Matthew G. and Bob M. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue The Secrets of Star Trek and all the shows at StarQuest. Now is a great time to become a StarQuest patron, thanks to a generous gift from a StarQuest supporter. When you start a new Patreon monthly pledge at sqpn.com slash give, the first three months will be matched by an equal amount from our donor to support all our shows, including this one, which makes your gift go even further. And we're more than halfway to our goal of $2,000 in new monthly pledges, which will support some very necessary projects to help us in the future, which you will benefit from. So why don't you help us close the gap? If you've been thinking of becoming a StarQuest patron, now is the time. Visit sqpn.com slash give today. That's it from us. What did you think of Galileo 7? You can let us know at sqpn.com slash trek or our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Media. Or send an email to trek at sqpn.com. We'll be back next time. We have a special treat for you, uh, sort of for the, uh, uh, let's just say, for the beginning of April. We have a special treat where we're going to be talking about not something specifically Star Trek. We're going to be talking about an homage to Star Trek, Galaxy Quest, the movie. So until then, Father Corey Stika, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Star Trek. Thank you, Dom. Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Thank you, and live long and prosper. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Star Trek on StarQuest. And remember, picturesque descriptions will not mend broken circuits, Mr. Scott.